We're ready. Good morning, everyone. Ready? Yes. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Liz Niss. I'm president of the League of Women Voters, and it's a pleasure to welcome everybody this morning. I am going to be brief. You have a very exciting and intense program, and I want to give my heartfelt thanks to Lisa Ratner, who has been working on this for several weeks now. I think it's going to be a spectacular program, just as it's a spectacular day. So welcome, everyone. Enjoy the meeting. Okay. Um, welcome everyone. I'm Lisa Ratner. I'm uh, advocacy, advocacy chair of our local league. Uh, and I've been tasked with organizing this program today. Um, here is what we're going to do. Oh, sorry. Let me start again. I need to share. Okay, share my screen. And you guys see that? No. No? No. Okay. No. Okay. Go here. Why why can't I share it? Okay. I'm gonna start. Maybe this worked before. Okay, let's share again. You guys see that? Yes. All right. Good. Thank goodness. Okay. So what is our goal for today? Our goal is to decide what public policy issues for community education and advocacy to focus on for four years. First, we're going to go through the local program focuses for the coming year, and then we're going to cover the national program focuses for the next two years. What about the state? We don't, do we do the state next year? Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, the first, and this is how it's going to go. We're going to, I'm first going to talk about the overview of the league's purpose and its work. Then we're going to do local programs and then national programs. As a review, the league's purpose as a nonpartisan political organization is to encourage and form an active participation in government to increase understanding of major public policy issues through both education and advocacy, and to actually influence public policy through both education and advocacy. The League also runs the uh, Education Fund, and there you'll find the Voter Services Program and the very important candidate forums, Voter Reg and Vote 411. We're not going to be talking about those today. Uh, how does the League select its issues? This is important for us to know because that's how we should select our issues. Education and advocacy program are based on principles of government set out in the Impact on Issues publication, which I hope you've all taken a look at. Uh, and there you'll find positions on many, many different subjects, ranging from arms control to agricultural policy and, of course, civic engagement uh, and franchise. There's also principles and policies and toolkits adopted by our national board, which are available for our use in advocacy. And these uh, policies sometimes are competing with each other. So unlike environmental organizations or civil rights organizations, where they basically are focusing on one, uh, one overarching policy, we have many different policies. And sometimes they conflict with each other. And we have to make decisions about which policy should take precedent. Our state and local leagues can rely on the national positions, but we also have our own state positions and local positions, as well as our action plans and policies. For example, the state league has come up with a homeless action plan, which many uh, local leagues are using. 
State and local leagues must speak with one voice. That means that our local positions can't contradict state or national positions, and we are not allowed to lobby state or national uh, uh, people in, in office because that is the uh, league's, um, the national league's uh, jurisdiction, actually. We're going to first start with our local programs, all looked at through a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens. Uh, we're first going to look at affordable housing for all. Then we're going to look at climate change. Then we're going to look at local campaign finance, finance reform, then gun safety, then civics ed, and then we'll have a presentation from Equal Justice. So right now, I would like to um, stop sharing uh, and invite Steve Levy to begin with the, uh, our Housing and Transportation, Housing for All and Transportation Committee. But we're going to get to back to this slide. Should we continue with these issues? Uh, what other issues do you think our league should focus on? Do we need new positions and what should our league be known for? So we're going to save time at the end of the local uh, presentations for this discussion. And after that, we'll go on to the national. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing. There we go. And I'll take it away, Steve. Thanks. Um, everyone should know that in addition to Lisa's running this and the advocacy program, she's basically been running the housing committee. I'm terrible at Zoom and everybody should be thanking Lisa for that and for her tremendous effort. Palo Alto is facing two ongoing sets of housing issues this year. We're required under state law to update the housing element to meet the requirements to proactively designate and approve housing for 6,000 units spread across all four income groups from very low to market rate. That process is complicated, but the quick summary is we need to identify sites that could hold the housing we need to look at constraints because we like virtually every other city has failed to meet much lower housing goals. Uh -huh. So it seems obvious that we're going to need major new programs to overcome the constraints. And the third piece is we're required in the element to affirmatively support the state's fair housing goals. There are also housing projects like the teacher housing project and others that will come up. So what is the committee and the, the local league uh, traditionally do? Lisa touched on a bunch of those. The committee has suggested positions to the emergency action committee that have been approved. And the league has spoken out in many cases on housing issues in the past. Individual members can add their own voice at meetings and in letters. Um, we do education. We just had an event called Housing for All that had a, a large registration and a pretty good actual attendance. And I've been following up with them on how the housing element work is going to keep them um, in the loop. We've partnered with allies on that event, um, the Palo Alto Community Fund, the Renters Association, Palo Alto Forward. Um, you guys have supported and co-sponsored some of Palo Alto Forward's events. We co-sponsor your events. One of the things going forward that Lisa mentioned on her slides that I asked her not to show because they interfere with um, kind of the way I talk was that we need to build allies. We have a bunch of new ones from the event, the Renters Association and the Palo Alto Community Fund that we can look forward to partnering with. The big gap, and I ask for everyone's help, is we don't have a consistent environmental ally. They say they support housing, but rarely have they shown up or signed our petitions. And so that's a huge gap in our ally base to be filled. What could we do specifically this year with regard to the housing element and projects. The housing element is pretty complicated, but there are a couple of things that drop out 
that the committee will be bringing forth recommendations to the league. The first is, um, we were the first of now five organizations to circulate a petition urging recommendation adoption of the Palo Alto Civil Grand Juries, sorry, Santa Clara County Civil Grand Juries recommendations to make it more likely that affordable housing proposals will be brought forward and to make it more even likely that they will be adopted. And we should be bird dogging this at the planning commission, at the city council. I don't know when it will come up, but we should be staunch advocates of us. Um, some of them deal with incentives and the committee can take care of that. A bunch of them deal with good government, like improving and expediting the process. And I hope the league good government folks can join us and present the grand jury recommendations as good government recommendations. So that's one specific that we can do this year. Lisa has the idea, um, if we have the bandwidth of doing a major education effort around financing options. Financing is the largest barrier and constraint as Cheryl would, could tell you for um, low income housing projects. Um, Lisa has some ideas about what we could do locally. My guess is that probably is an education effort for the future because this year they're gonna have the business tax. But I think um, even though we're gonna discuss the state next year, that there's lots that the local leagues can do to encourage the state to increase funding and incentives for, for low income housing. So I don't wanna to take too much time. So the summary is, continue to advocate around um, issues that come up with the housing element update, up emphasizing the grand jury recommendations, look at financing, hold additional events. I know when I talked to Dan after the housing for all event that he was ready to go with another event. Uh, Palo Alto Forward's gonna be holding a couple of events that we'll ask you to co-sponsor and really um, look into building the ally base, both with the uh, the people who've signed our petition and co-sponsored our housing parole event and with other local leagues. So I'll stop there if there are any questions. I have a question. Go ahead, Ellen. Um, what can you tell us about the petition that's being circulated um, sure. that basically would attack SB9 and whatever? What, is it, what does it actually say? Because I didn't read it because I wasn't going to sign it. Um, what does it actually say? What level is it operating on? Okay. When I talked to the deputy director at HCD, who's a longtime friend, they don't know. It appears very broad and subject to interpretation. Um, it's being circulated as against SB9 and perhaps SB10, which are very limited parts of the state's housing arsenal and the city's responsibility. But um, the legal people I know say it could be interpreted to stop almost anything. So that's a um, maybe too long um, answer that I don't really know and the experts don't really know, but it's scary. Um, I've heard that it's struggling to get signatures, but I don't know that firsthand. I, I heard somebody talk about it at a um, league event put on by the South uh, Santa Clara Valley folks and the speaker said it probably would not make the ballot this year. So that is eight minutes, Lisa, on that presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, our next presentation is on climate change and we have Hillary. Great, yeah. thank you. All right. Green. We all have to say this out loud so we don't mess it up. And here we go. Um, so I am here to talk about the um, 
Natural Resources uh, team. I am representing Mary Okiki, who is my co-committee uh, chair on this meeting, and I will now uh, get going. So I want to just ground us in the League of Women Voters of California climate positions. There are many. I just want to highlight a few. The first is promoting energy conversation easy for me to say, energy conservation and efficiency and land use policies that reduce vehicle miles traveled. Um, they also promote carbon pricing and other items. I want to double click on the one that says, promote solutions that ease the consequences of climate related hardships to low and moderate income households. Um, from the Palo Alto perspective, I read that as provide an equitable and affordable transition to clean transportation and buildings for low to moderate income households. Um, the League of California also really uh, supports conservation and electrification. So the goal is to reduce the need for energy and electrify the remaining use, uh, uses. I want to encourage everyone today, as it's a beautiful day, to do your part to conserve. As the day warms up, turn your heaters off, open up your windows, let all the nice heat come into your house, and then close it up at the end of the day, and you will dramatically reduce the amount of natural gas you burn today heating your home. So just something you can do as the day goes on. Um, our current focus areas are on two areas. One is food waste and food choice. Um, Mary is very involved in this at a state and at a, a national level. And we're also focusing on building electrification, which includes gas health and safety issues. I know a number of you probably read about the recent Stanford study saying that uh, gas stoves are pretty scary. And if you haven't, I'd be happy to send that to you. Uh, let's start on food waste and food choice. And the uh, asterisks are only for my um, notes to make sure that I, I emphasize some points here. So please ignore them. Um, it turns out that a third of worldwide greenhouse gas emissions are from food and that about a third of the food produced in the US is wasted. Um, composting is important, particularly the kind of composting we do here where the methane is, is captured and burned. However, it does not offset food waste. It's, you know, it's, it's just a way of repairing from it. California has passed this dramatic law, uh, SB 1383, which requires the reduction of organic um, food waste. It means that restaurants and uh, food service things, as well as individuals, all have to pull organic waste out of their trash and compost it. The goal is to reduce organic waste 75% by 2025. Um, I heard this, it was, I have to read this to you. If we uh, achieve this goal, it will prevent 88 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions, which is like taking 1.7 million cars off the road for a year or powering every single family home in California on zero emission energy for an entire year. So something as simple as not throwing your your, your meat and your eggs and your other crap into your trash and putting it into your compost bin and getting local businesses to do that is hugely beneficial. Um, just as a commentary on food, uh, you've probably heard this before that, that uh, animal-based food creates more emissions than plant-based food and lower meat diets are associated with better health outcomes. And I get to show this slide, which I think makes people queasy, but we'll show it anyway. Um, this is a slide showing the correlation between eating uh, meat and having heart disease and cancer. Um, and I just think it's a great slide. So what I always find things is that things that are good for the planet are also good for us. For example, when you put on a lot of sunblocks, you're killing the, the, uh, the reefs and the fish in the reefs. It also turns out that you're getting some pretty bad stuff in your body as well. This is another thing, reduce your amount of, of meat and you reduce your risk of heart disease and cancer. All right, so if you're interested in food waste, there's a lot of opportunities to act locally. Um, you can advocate with the city to try to have more low carbon food choices at city events or lunches that are hosted by the city. For example, the chili cook-off, making this up as I go along, could have a big focus on plant-based or low meat chili options. You could also become a zero waste block leader, which will become pretty darn important as we try to make sure that everybody is not throwing their organic waste in their trash. Um, Virginia uh, Van Curen is a zero waste block leader, as are many people you probably don't even know they're zero waste block leaders. It's a, a great role you can fill. You can work with high school students on food choices and food waste at schools. 
Um, you can read the climate calls that our buddy Hannah has been so great to put in every one of the lead communications where there are things you can do to reduce your carbon footprint. Um, there are food waste reduction ideas in some of our past issues and lower meat diet suggestions as well. Um, you can create education events around food waste and food choices, and you can promote and actually utilize yourself plant-based recipes. Um, I put, I have my own Google Drive where I've been chucking low meat or no meat recipes for the last few years. I invite all of you to join it. I've created this wonderful bit.ly call that you can click on, which will take you to this uh, website. Please go ahead and join, comment, put your own uh, uh, recipes in there. It's uh, bit.ly slash more than tofu. I wanted a, a shorter uh, URL, but unfortunately those were all taken already. Um, let's talk a little bit about building electrification. This is the area that I am very focused on. Why am I focused on it? The um, scientific consensus is that if we can reduce methane, um, which as you probably know, both in the, in the taking it out of the ground, refining it, distributing it, burning it, a lot of methane escapes in the process. It is a nasty greenhouse gas. It is 85 times more effective at CO2 of um, causing planetary warming. So all the methane that escapes in the process is really bad stuff. Um, the good news is it has a very short half-life. So if in the next 10 years, we can dramatically reduce the amount of methane we use, we can probably avert up to a third a degree of global warming. And that's Celsius. You always have to remember that when you listen to those things. Um, there has been uh, a lot of focus lately on home electrification. And that means as your gas appliances in your home um, are reaching their end of life, there now are good and um, very smart and slightly more affordable, but we still have a ways to go on that, uh, appliances available that you can switch over and they're cleaner and they are safer and they, um, they can be put into your home. Um, and that we Hillary, need to- Hillary, you have about a minute left. Oh my goodness, I had no idea. I thought I had, I have only seven minutes. I do, I thought I had more than this. Okay, let me just hustle through that. The health and safety, I've talked this all, this already. Um, we need your help uh, to advocate uh, on these issues, either at the county, state, or national level. We need to make sure that we are making an equitable transition to electric homes and cars. We're working very closely with the city to make sure that they are you know, doing the right things on that process. Um, there are, uh, Lots of opportunities for articles, presentations, videos, and webinars, and please read the climate calls. There are things you can do. Um, our plan for 2022 is to continue our advocacy uh, efforts on both food and electrification. Um, also continue to create and provide these climate calls and look for more partnership opportunities um, for education. And finally, an, an idea that I have that I'd love to work with someone on is try to figure out who are the local influencers, teachers, real estate agents, Girl Scouts, who we can teach about, about electrification, and they can be a one-to-many advocate for that. I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I don't know if anyone, do I get time for questions or do I use Yeah, que que time? questions, questions now. I, I've got a sort of a comment. This this area of um, climate change has many, many different aspects to it. And um, our, our task forces, our interest groups, our, our committee, our Natural Resources Committee welcomes people who have other particular interests that touch upon this issue. For example, if you have an interest in water, flooding, um, there, there are many, many different types of climate change issues. And these are the only one, these issues are the ones that we have, the current committee has time for. But if you join the committee, you certainly will, you know, we're very welcome to uh, bring up uh, your favorite issue. As long as you can find a position <laughs> that, that supports it in the league. And there are many, there are many climate positions. Just uh, looks like Megan has a question. Yeah, I mean, I feel like, Every time I hear you speak, we need to do more education on some of the key topics that you all are working on. Yep. Um, just even the gas stove to electric stove, right? I, and, and maybe I'm missing it, but I'm just wondering if we could do more programming. And I know today isn't about that, but like link this to our programming in ways that are very practical 
um, for people to be able to take bites of the work you're talking about that is so impactful and act on it. But maybe I'm not I'm not reading things and seeing things. It's my fault, but I feel just like that would be a really great connect what you're doing to our other pieces of our work. Yes. Um, yeah. And, and just a quick comment on gas stoves. Gas stoves are the one emotional area people have. No one cares about the rest of their stuff. They just want help from the city doing it because it's going to be expensive. But gas stoves are emotional. The fact that all this information is coming about, out about the health issues, Megan, I think is a game changer in terms of education and getting people who previously would never have gotten rid of their gas stove to consider it. So I think we're very real time finding information that can help us and we can partner with Actera. There's a lot we can do about around this whole gas stove issue. I'd like to just throw in, um, I credit Alison Carmack with this. She pointed out that if you, you try to sell the new induction uh, stoves, burners and forth as, as the equivalent of the Tesla, that this is really forward thinking. This is great. You know, people here are, are, are in some ways really, uh, you know, early adopters. So by by having something that you promote as good, as better, as new and exciting might help more people like my husband to get rid of their gas stove. That's, that's a very fair comment. Thank you, Ellen. Okay, any other questions or why I should hand it back to uh, Lisa? Yeah. Let's go, let's go back. Thank you so much, Hillary. That was great. Um, next, I'm gonna do uh, the campaign finance reform. Hopefully I can find it. Uh, okay, can you see that? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Try again. Get this. Okay, share screen. About that you see that yes yeah. we can see it okay Here do you want to play yeah go ahead okay uh our campaign finance reform uh task force started in 2019 uh here's what we've done we've studied other cities approaches to this issue we looked at the history of campaign financing in palo alto we looked at the legal basis for reforms we developed proposals and presented them to the city council uh, in September through December of, of 2021 formally. And we asked the council to enact them. So what's the league's position on money in politics? Before, because to do this work, we need a league position to work from. We wanna, the league says that uh, campaign finance reform should combat the appearance of corruption or undue influence provide for reasonable voluntary limits on campaign spending and reasonable mandatory limits on donations, ensure the public's right to know who's using money to influence elections. So what were our goals? So they pretty much uh, follow the league's uh, positions. Reduce the outsized influence of big donors in our city elections. Stop the skywriting, skyrocketing costs of running for city council. Protect our right to know who's spending money and make it easier for people without access to wealth to run for council. So we had three proposals to the council. One, donation limits of $500. The default state limit is 4,900. Voluntary spending limits of $30,000. currently, it says no limit, but there is currently a limit. Yeah, no, there is currently no limit. And there's, there will never be a mandatory limit uh, because of the first amendment. So these all have to be voluntary limits. And also disclose the five largest funders of political ads who are spending $2,500 on local, local ads. And that includes television, radio, print, online ads, mass mailers, and robocalls. Why do we need these reforms? Well, 20 to 25 individual big donors, each contributing more than $3,500, accounted for one third of winning candidate donations in our elections between 2014 and 2020. That's really shocking. Our, our average election spending has been up 64% since 2014 to six, over $65,000. That's much higher than bigger, much bigger cities are surrounding us and ordinary citizens cannot afford to run or compete in this armed race. 
Uh, and skyrocketing spending requires the candidates to look to wealthy people in industry for support, leading to a public perception that these folks have may have an undue, undue influence on our elected officials, and that decreases engagement and trust in our local government. So what have other cities done? More than 100 other cities have adopted the reforms that we're talking about. Mountain View has a campaign expenditure, voluntary limit of $27,400. It goes up uh, by COLA for each election year. Cupertino, uh, a city about our size, has uh, a voluntary campaign expenditure limit of $30,000. San Mateo County, which is about 10 times bigger than we are, uh, has a donation limit of $1,000. Santa Clara County has uh, a population of almost 2 million, and their donation limit is $1,000 for candidates who agree to spending limits and $500 for those who do not. What, are, what, are, what is our plan in the coming year? We're going to continue to work with the city council to garner support. We're going to draft an ordinance if there, we have no uh, movement from the city very shortly, an ordinance that codifies our proposal. We will need some money to hire an attorney. We're going to continue to speak to community groups to build broad-based support for this ordinance. And then we're going to draft an ordinance and initiative. If there's no council action, we're going to gather the signatures necessary to get it on the ballot and get the initiative passed. Are there any questions? Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, and so, the, have we, so is it over to me, Lisa? Yes. Oh, okay. I was wondering if we have actually done any education of the public about this yet. That's uh, of the public. Um, we have sent out uh, action. We've I've covered it in our voter. Uh, and we sent out action alerts, but as far as an actual educational event, no, and that's on our, the very next thing that we plan to do, actually, is to okay. organize a community education event around this topic. Great question. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> it's, not, it's not that easy a subject to understand once you start getting into the First Amendment uh, complications of it, but it's very necessary. Anyone else have a question? Lisa, could I do a time check with you? Yes. You want to be done at 1.45? No, 11.45. Yeah. I'm I sorry, 11.45. 10.45, I'm sorry. We might get to 11. Let's get to 11 on this. Because okay. we started a few, we started about 10 minutes late. Okay, our next, uh, our next uh, group is going to be uh, gun safety. And it's going to be Stacy. I am going to hit share. And then hopefully you see a, a slide. Do you see a slide? Yep. Okay, great. Okay, so um, along with uh, Hillary Glenn, I am one of the, the co-chairs of uh, the Responsible Gun Ownership Committee. Um, uh, basically, we advocate for gun safety in the community. Um, that doesn't mean we all are gun owners. It's just that we're advocating as per the second amendment that you're perfectly allowed to have a gun in your home as long um, as you comply with safety regulations. So the state level support for this issue is very clear on gun safety that we're protecting health and safety of our citizens. We're limiting accessibility and regulating ownership of guns, um, supporting regulation firearms for consumer safety. So. Bottom line, safety first is the is the state level stance. Um, our focus is largely on raising, you know, just like everybody's talking about for um, climate and 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 other issues. This is a uh, this is an education thing that we need to tie in with programming about the increase in gun sales during the pandemic, even here in California. The gaps in state gun laws, even though California is the safest uh, of all the states, uh, there are plenty of gaps that make it not safe because um, the laws are not consistent, obviously, um, as well as that the demographics and the presence of guns in our community is not all that different from um, 
Parkland, Florida, or um, Newtown, Connecticut, where Sandy Hook um, occurred. Our demographics in terms of education and income is, is quite close, which means um, that we're very much in a preventative uh, mode of action here. We don't want to wait until a tragedy happens. We want to be preventative in that um, because our community is quite similar. Um, similarly, guns can easily obviously transfer between cities and states and counties. You just drive across a border and, and the gun is there. Um, so um, background checks are very inconsistent. Um, online sales are through the roof, um, as well as these untraceable ghost guns, which are basically these DIY kits where you order this ghost gun and they ship you a DIY kit of assemble your own gu gun at home. It has no license, no registration, no way of being traced. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a big importance here in Palo Alto is the um, suicide prevention. Um, just like we have been working on our, our, our train tracks as, as an area, reducing access to, to the train tracks is reducing access to the means of suicide. Guns are the same way. If you have a high risk of suicide, the last thing you want to do is um, have guns available to that person. Uh, uh, and last but not least, there is a disproportionate risk uh, for people with mental illness, people of color, um, when it comes to gun violence um, in general. Um, so this past year, well, our big accomplishment um, was that we did get the city council to pass. We're so appreciative that this, this went through. This took us about a year, year and a half, I think, but um, because there was a pandemic in the middle there. But um, the Santa Clara County does have a safe storage ordinance that if you have a gun in your home, it must be locked. Um, but the county doesn't have jurisdiction over the cities. They only have jurisdiction over the unincorporated county areas. So um, this was very critical that we get Palo Alto ordinance to say, if you have a gun in your home, it must be stored um, locked and safely. Um, we are in progress. We started advocating with the school board. Um, I saw that Jennifer DiBrienzo was on this call. Um, a little while ago, um, starting advocating here for parental notification of the safe storage ordinance. So that's in progress. Um, and we're continuing our alliances with these three local chapters that are also doing this um, nonpartisan gun safety work, Moms Demand Action, Brady Center, and Giffords. Um, so in this current year, we're, um, we're going to continue working forward with the city council and the police department. We wanna make it clear um, education-wise and outreach to the community that this um, safe storage ordinance is in effect. Um, and we have access to free gun locks that the police department could make available to anybody in the community who doesn't have a way to lock their gun up safely. Um, we are planning to reach out to Project Safety Night Net as a liaison between the city and the schools um, to talk about the suicide prevention and in general, the risk of, um, of guns in the, unlocked guns in the homes to, to children. Um, we're kind of moving in the direction of trying to normalize the conversation. If you bring your child to another family's house for a play date, you might ask about peanut allergies or are they allergic to cats? Um, we wanna normalize the conversation. Is there a gun in the home? And is it, if so, is it locked securely? Um, the estimates are that 30 to 35% of the homes right here in Santa Clara and Seven Hale counties have at least one gun in the home. And since I started this work, at least a dozen people have come up to me and whispered that they had have a gun in their home. So we know that's the case. And uh, one kind of vision dream is that we might get on the city website a PSA about this ordinance, um, about why it's important. So continuing advocating for parental notification of safe storage um, at the school district level, we really want a resolution that, um, that states that this is an annual thing that will be notified, um, not a one-off uh, notification by the PTA. Um, and Assembly Bill 452 did just pass in the Assembly that um, would make a state mandate for school districts to do this parental notification about safe storage. Um, the next step is that moves on to the Senate. So there's no reason to wait on this because plenty of school districts right here in our area, including Mountain View, Wisman, and Sequoia Union High School District have already passed such re resolutions this, this past year, 2021. So um, there's no reason for us to wait for a state mandate on that because we want to be preventative. Um, and we're following the ghost gun ban that is going on in San Francisco and the mandatory fees for gun owners and insurance that San Jose is in progress of working on. Um, so this is our small but mighty team of four. Uh, we usually meet uh, once a month for about an hour on Zoom. Um, we have two email lists. One is our active committee members, which is a few more than the four of us, but the four of us are the ones that usually show up. Um, and we've started an interest list. So if any league members on the renewal check an interest in, in this issue, um, we'll do periodic uh, updates to that group, that wider group as well, about, especially about actions folks can take. 
one of our new members we heard from recently uh, is a Stanford physician and um, she has extensive experience with public health risk um, with guns and suicide. So um, we're just really happy that we've, we've heard from her. Um, so we have roles in all of these aspects, reaching out to city, school, community, as well as legislative kind of advocacy work. So we are open and eager to um, move forward on educating folks. And I can now stop sharing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, stop sharing. Okay. Questions mm -hmm. on time, 1042. Okay, we've got to any questions on the for um, Stacy? Bravo. Go for it. Thank you. Can't hear you. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Very quickly. Sorry. I just want to comment that one of the things we're doing is we're trying to be fast followers. We are not trying to be innovators in terms of our legislation. That's why Stacy noted people who other cities do things, we're going to watch them, we're going to monitor, and we're going to see what the NRA does. And if things go well there, we'll plan them here. But we're not going to be, we're not going to be trying new things that haven't been vetted by other cities. Great. Okay. Thank That's you. a great Thank strategy. You. Yeah. Okay. Our next uh, topic is civics ed. Take it away, Jen. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for being here today. Um, Louise, you have my slides if you want to pull up slide number one. Okay. All right, civic said program planning update. Uh, so I wanted to lead with you know why this matters on several levels and why I'm very passionate about it. Um, for the first time in 2018, the Gen Z, Gen X and millennial vote count exceeded that of the boomers by about 51% to 49%. So if you're ever feeling down about the current state of our democracy, um, just hang out with the young people. And uh, Louise, you wanna go back to slide one? Just hang out with the young people. Here in Palo Alto, we have 4,000 high schoolers, which has been our focus in the initial pilot phase of the uh, civic ed engagement program. And so uh, let's go ahead to the first slide and we'll take a look at what we've accomplished in a very short period of time. First, I wanna thank, um, our former Madam Pres, uh, Nancy Shepard, for her inspiration in this. Uh, also, Dr. Jiang Cho, who's Director of Innovation and Agility with Palo Alto School District Administration. And more importantly, Ms. Casey, who worked with both the Pali and the Gun High School students um, from our pilot phase all the way to where we are today. So in September 2020, the state passed uh, something called the State Seal of Civic Engagement. The acronym is one of hundreds called the SSCE. So in January 21, the board here approved a mentorship model, which I was happy to step up for working under uh, Janet's uh, leadership in the CE committee. And during the 2021 school year, we started the pilot program to engage students at both the high schools in what we call the civic engagement club. So they could learn more about what the SSCE meant and how they could get involved. Our club projects engage students in uh, community and thoughtful re reflection on topics around CE. Many of you participated in our reunited states uh, initiative last February, so a year ago, where we enabled a panel discussion which included our high schoolers and other members of the league to discuss the state of our democracy and the need to create bridge builders going forward. Um, our teacher sponsor, Ms. Casey, had all the while was promoting the club work around the SSCE to the Palo Alto administrators and boom, lo and behold, it was approved and adopted as part of the full district goal inclusion in June of last year, which was a very exciting development. This update was provided by uh, Dr. Cho to the school board in October and today, uh, 20, 21, 22 school year, the vast majority of the Cal, the Pali and Gun student graduates uh, will be SSCE certified. So, you know, Hillary, you mentioned fast follower. So we've been reaching out to Santa Clara County, Monterey County. Number of these districts have been working for several several years to step up the uh, civic engagement programs in their schools. Um, we're just delighted to see the level of embracing by the Palo Alto School District of the league's effort to, to mentor this model. 
So let's go ahead now and take a look at what's remaining to be done. Uh, specific action requests, and it sounds like with these program updates, there are a number of opportunities to create some non-paying internships for student engagement with the league. Part of their certification requires a 15 hours of um, uh, community service. So for example, it could be around gun safety, uh, the climate activity that Hillary you're working on and many other areas. And so this is one ask that uh, I will be pursuing with leaders of the committees here in, in the league. Um, it, this winter, uh, I am engaging with students, and, and the, the model that's been most successful, ironically, is through the mandatory programs like Living Skills, Social, path, social Justice Pathways, and at Gun, there's something called the SELF program, which is Social, Emotional, Literacy, and Functionality. So kind of the non-academic angle has been the one where we've, we've gained the greatest embracing and success of the civic education um, component of the curriculum. Uh, in spring, I'll be partnering with the voter services team going on site. I believe um, I'll be with the gun group uh, in the month of March. And I'm hopeful that we can do some formal congratulatory um, messaging uh, from the league to the gun and pally, the first cohort of students to come out certified with the state seal of civic engagement. So for the 2022-23 plan, and this is consistent with the initial vision that, uh, that Nancy had for this effort, is to explore expansion of CE projects in the K through 12 arena. Right now we're focused from the post-pilot phase in the high schoolers, uh, about the 4,000 students. And then to promote, continue promoting Educating for American Democracy, which is a nationwide level um, which is highly scalable for grades from K all the way through 12 to enable um, critical thinking around topics of civic engagement and uh, civics ed. And so I, it looks like that's my old slide. List. So um, I, I encourage you to go <laughs> to YouTube and check out the Louisville, Kentucky statewide choir singing of the national anthem. Uh, it's three minutes long. Take a moment. It was on KCBS this morning as I was working on my material. Um, I find great inspiration from working with our young people. And they, I think, take inspiration from working with us. It's a mutual learning model. I learn something new every time I engage um, with the club members. And I think you would as well. So the one key action that I'm leaving you with today is how can we create some non-paying internships to help these students um, complete their curriculum and engage with the uh, programs that we have um, in the hopper? And with that, I'll take any questions or comments. Thank you, Hillary. Jen, Megan Fogarty has one in chat. Yeah, I'm just wondering why not through social studies to have it taken seriously, uh, living skills, has always been super weak and not valued. And I'm just wondering if, I don't understand what it means to be certified. I, you can probably send me a link so I can, you don't have to go into that, but why there and why not in the core curriculum? Yeah, uh, great question. Yeah. Why, why not? Um, I think the reason why we have zero participation at GUN and pretty good participation at Pali is I think there's a intensive focus on the uh, uh, the academic curriculum at GUN, and and a reluctance to take time out of that curriculum for things like civic engagement. And Megan, while that's a good question, I'm happy to make traction where we can. Um, this and the self program at GUN, I think, are offering an opportunity to at least get a foot in the door, right? And that coupled with the curriculum being driven tops down from the uh, administration, I think, has given us an opportunity to, to continue building on the pilot that we started a year ago. So one idea might be, since so many students take that living skills in the summer, to pilot something where we have interns working with the league in the summer, because that might be an interesting way to do it. Yeah, that's a great idea. And I think the interns, I'm speaking with one of the students on Monday, um, would be interested in starting intern uh, activity now, I, I, I think, uh, and I'm hopeful that we'll get some gun participation. But um, 
you know, gun, gun students are, you know, limited to summer engagement, so be it. But really, it is one of our goals to get a greater engagement at gun, at least some baseline engagement, and to continue uh, growing the, the base at Pally. Other questions, feedback, comments? I put something in the chat for you, Jen, when you have a chance. Jennifer DiBrienta has a hand up, so do I. Hold Interesting, on. Gun is more engaged in climate change action than Pally. It's because Mr. Ledgerwood at Gun, I believe. Yeah. So Two hands up. Had a hand up. Okay. Jeannie. Jennifer had her hand up before I did. Jennifer. Can you guys hear me? De Brienza. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Sorry if my camera's not on. You do not want to see me right now. Um, uh, but I was going to just speak to what Megan said, because she's right. It's been, this has long been a sort of living skills and self, I mean, living skills is separate from self, but uh, living skills itself definitely needs revamping. And there's constant talk about, do you tinker around the edges or do you completely, you know, dismantle it and start again? Um, but I think that our staff thought that this was a good place to include it, um, both because we have more say at the district level about what goes into that class as opposed to, hey, put it in social studies and you're trying to convince each social studies teacher to incorporate it. Um, and there's no sort of standardization of it or guarantee it'll happen where I think the district felt they had more control over the living skills classes. But I, I share your hope that we still revamp them meaningfully and, include, and keep this stuff um, embedded in there. Thank you, Jennifer. And my issue is, uh... The issue of civics education from my perspective is one of the most important issues facing the nation. There are people who are saying they don't want to teach about slavery in schools. Why? Because it'll make students, white students feel uncomfortable. You know, and so this is a revamp in, in some ways of the social studies curriculum. And I, I'm sorry, I intended to look this up, but I haven't. Uh, is there a national movement with respect to civics education, is there a yes. state movement? Yes, it is called Educating for American Democracy. It was launched in March of last year, and it is in the resource, resource page on the back of my slide deck. Oh, this is the PFAD program. No, it's, it's, oh, it's, it's related. It's American Democracy. Yeah, it's yeah. related, but a different effort it. with 300 academicians, Harvard and Tufts and so on and so forth, so go to the link in the back of my slides, you'll see that resource link. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and, and again, it, it, even at the national level, it's been, been fairly slow to roll out, right? It's taken right, a right. long time. Right, right. And so is the program that you're using in the schools here going to be the same as other schools that have joined the PFAD group? That my hope would be through uh, embracing education Educating for American Democracy, which is the national program, right. that it would be uh, uh, unified with what other states and counties and districts adopt over time. Thanks. Good. Uh, Kathy. Yeah, hi. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, I know that Rachel Kellerman, who did a, we did a, in Voter Services, we did an internship thing last summer, and we were talking about maybe doing another one this summer uh, she just hinted at that to me the other day because i had said what if we made podcasts of the different um uh the pros and cons <clears throat> and and she was thinking maybe students could help work on that uh, to make great create podcasts for the ballot measures for the fall that would be fantastic kathy thank you any other questions comments thank you for the excellent feedback mm -hmm. thank you for the work yeah yeah thank you thank you jen uh, okay, next up is uh, our Equal Justice team. Uh, they're working on a new name, but uh, take it away, Ellen. And by the way, we're going to hopefully we'll get done by a little after. Ellen, can we hear you? Yeah, now you can. Sorry. Okay, yeah, hopefully. We can wrap up the uh, discussion of um, local issues and have our uh, our vote on this, uh, get everything done by 11.15, and we're at 10.56 now, so go Fine. for it. Okay, can you see my screen? Yeah. 
Okay. No, 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 I can't. No, you're oh. not sharing yet. Oh, okay. Um, I asked a screen share. Let's see. Is that working? Now we can see. Oh, good. Yes. Okay, fine. Good. Okay, so um, as uh, Lisa said, we are still working on our final name right. for this group, but for now we're calling it diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. There are a lot of elements involved in this, and we'll come up with some great name. But um, the first thing I wanted to um, emphasize is that DEI is really important in the league. If you go to the national bylaws, there's Article 1, and then there's Article 2. The, uh, one is just the name. Article 2 is purposes and policies. Purposes is short. And the policies are simply two. The fact that we don't oppose or support political parties or candidates and DEI. So this is right up there. Um, we are in the startup phase now. Uh, when we transitioned to this wonderful new members website, um, uh, Carrie put in all the various interests and um, the two of them that she listed were equal justice and DEI. And um, DEI is, um, was just described as diversity, equity, inclusion. And so um, 31 people signed up as being interested in one or the other or both. Um, the work we're doing is just ground floor foundational right now. And we've had three organizational meetings to date. And uh, <clears throat> let's see. Now, each of those meetings has addressed what is our mission purpose? What do we expect to get out of this work? How can we measure success? How can we diversify our league? What does that entail? And our current preference is for one combined group, not to have two separate equal justice or equity issues or anything, and then a separate DEI. <clears throat> and uh, the goal is probably to have one combined group with sections uh, focused on either different aspects of DEIJ or functioning in different ways. Um, some might want to do hands-on, quick um, project type things. Others might want to focus on longer term um, uh, theory um, ways of approaching this. Um, so the status report is we have a Google group. Uh, the next meeting is uh, to be decided right now. It's the 21st, 24th, or March 1. And we'll, um, we'll continue to do organizational next steps thinking, but uh, Jeannie will have some role-playing scenarios uh, for us to practice. And uh, we're still coming up with some wonderful, clever name. And leadership spots are open. And we encourage anybody to join the team um, because in June of 2020, the league board, our board, made a statement that it is a 2020-2021 priority that our league and its members become educated about and take action to address the systemic racism that denies rights and justice for black neighbors in all of its manifestations. Well, of course, this was right after the George Floyd murder. And um, there are uh, so many aspects to diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, racial justice, um, inclusion of uh, LGBTQIA plus um, disabled um, or differently abled. Um, there is so much to this um, whole area that we could work on. And we encourage all of you who are, have the slightest interest <laughs> to express to Jeannie and me that you are interested in participating in some way. So thank you. 
Any questions? If, if I could just add, there's a story right now about workers in a Tesla factory in Fremont who are being taunted, uh, black workers are being taunted on a daily basis, the Tesla floor in Fremont. Uh, that, that this is real, that people are experiencing this hatred, I think is what it is. Um, on a daily basis is something that has to be faced. It, it's got to be more than a program. It's got to be driven by heart and soul and deep understanding um, and so on. Thank you for, for listening. And thank you, Ellen, for that fabulous, uh, fabulously organized presentation. Thank you, it. Jeannie. All right. OK, yeah, thank you, Jeannie. Um, we're going to go back at this point to uh, our program planning. And we are at this point, should we continue with these issues through a DEI lens and in including voter services for our coming year? What other issues do you think our league should focus on locally? Uh, if, do we need any new positions and what should our league be known for? So I'm gonna start with the first question up there. Um, should we continue with the issues that we heard about this morning through a DEI lens and include voter services for the year 22-23? You can all raise, there's, there's I don't know how many people we've got, 27 people. Does anybody not want to do this? I guess I could raise your hand if you do not want to continue with these issues. Okay, since I can't see anybody. This is Karen. Do you mean only, yes. with, only with these issues? That, no, can, no, 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 because that's the, so it passed. the, the second. Yeah. Okay. This. Okay. That's a yes. Now, are there other issues you think our league should focus on and tell us why the issue is important, whether there's a league position, how can the league move the issue forward and who would work on it? Anybody want to come forward with any new issues? And again, since I can't see. It, it, so I've got my hand up, uh, Lisa. Okay, go for it. It's I'm the observer uh, at PAUSD uh, for our league, and it's um, a conundrum for me to notice that we do not have any body um, working on the issue of education in general. Um, that we don't have that is astonishing to me, but I, I'm an educator, and so, yeah, I have a bias, maybe. Yeah. Um, Jeannie, we had a very vibrant, uh, yeah, Nancy Shepard, we had a very vibrant education committee. Uh, Diane Rolf and Sigrid headed it, and it would be great if they want to restart it. Yeah, they could count on my joining them. <laughs> yeah. I, I wanted to speak to that too. Okay. Um, and particularly early childhood education, since it sounds it looks like there is there's a lot of funding coming to the school district right now and the school district has decided that they are interested in early childhood education to help with the achievement gap um and i think the league it's timely for us to reconstruct that committee i'm happy to reach out to those members if you want me to that would be great yeah because the the, the education committee that sigrid and um Diane, we're heading wars was focused particularly on early childhood education. Yeah, and it's a timely thing for the league to follow, in my opinion, and uh, build back better if they get a portion of it in. I think this does come from uh, even more money will come because universal preschool is part of the formula. Okay, great. Well, Nancy and anyone else who's interested in that, go forward and find people who want to work on it because we can propose as much as we want here, but we actually need people to step forward to work on it. I uh, sent in the observer's report yes. yesterday to the board and I urge everybody to read it. There are some, uh, some really wonderful new additions to things like, for instance, that every child 
in a PAUSD school has the right to ask for two meals a day, right? They don't have to declare, or nobody has to declare that they're homeless or hungry or whatever. They just have a right to ask for two meals a day. It's astonishing. Anyway. Thank you, Jeannie. Mm. Anybody else have any issues you think? You are have Jennifer and Liz um, have their hands okay. raised. Jennifer, I guess. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to speak to the early early um, childhood education group, which of which I was a part, and Sigrid and Diane ran it wonderfully, and they needed to take a step back and said, we would like to turn it off to someone, and none of us stood up to lead it. <laughs> so I think that there's not a lack of interest in it. There was just no one that was interested in heading up the committee. So I think that's really the big ask here. I'm sure a bunch of us will step up if someone has that time, but Diane and Sigrid said that they needed to step back, and we just fell apart. Right. Right. Uh, and again, I can't see because uh, I'm sharing. So who else has something to say? Liz. Liz. Okay. We can't right, you. see you, Liz. Here I am. Okay. So one of the, um, I'm so glad, Jeannie, you just spoke about having your observer report up. Um, I have real concerns since no one is observing the council right now. And I hope we can beat the bushes to find someone who is willing to do that. Um, our emphasis is very much around what is happening at City Hall. And we, we need somebody there to report on it. So for anyone, Perhaps somebody who is relatively new would be interested in doing that. Um, it, it's very important. So please, you know, let me or let somebody know if you hear of somebody who's willing to do that. And Janie, are you going to continue to do school board for a while? To do school board work? Sorry. No, no. Are you going to continue to be an observer? Oh, yes. Okay. I'd, wonderful. I'd love to. Oh, great. Yeah, observe PAUSD, yeah. Good, thank right, you so for, much. For the city council, there is a League of Women Voters report form, observer report form, which tells you uh, what to focus on. It's not providing the minutes of the meeting, you, you know, and and uh, and all of that kind of thing. It is our, is the group meeting uh, group principles and, and requirements, so. I'd be glad to talk to somebody if anybody will be willing to take on observing the city council. Good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Megan um, recommended campaign finance reform in the oh. chat. Oh yeah, that's what we're already doing that. Where are we? What question are you ask are you answering, Megan? Well, I'm I'm looking at the local program. Do we do we want to have an emphasis on either campaign finance reform or housing? Yeah, we already took a vote on that. That we continue. We asked. We asked the first question: Should we continue with these issues, the ones that we just were presented with? And uh, nobody said no. Oh, does yeah. it have to be stated in some way, though, or do we already have a statement? We it's are just the topic. Yeah, we're continue. We are going to continue with the with um, the uh with the issues that were covered um this morning discuss this morning. it discussed affordable housing for all climate change local campaign finance reform gun safety civics education and we're going to encourage uh ellen and everybody who's interested in forming that equal justice team to continue meeting and figure out what their mission and purpose will be so what I'm a little confused by is I thought we try to pick three to four key program areas. No, no, that we're not. It's like we're organizing ourselves. I no, mean, we, I we, don't. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, last last year the state the state league wanted us to for them they wanted us to pick three issues that they should focus on. There really was no limit on the number of issues we could focus on, and it turned out that we we picked we we in in you know, internet voting style, uh, affordable housing for all campaign finance reform and climate change came up at the, and civics ed came up at the, at the as the top four, uh, even though we had a, a very thriving uh, gun safety committee that had been approved by the board since 2018. There's no reason why we shouldn't just uh, continue with the programs that we have 
through our established committees. There's no, there's no you know, league reason why we have to limit it to three or, or four. Um, it really depends on what people are interested in and whether they want to work on the committee on that, on that area. I've just always found that if we have three to four and we really emphasize those, we put our capacity behind them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm sorry. All I, yeah. All I can say is we have people working very hard on all on these uh, five committees and maybe when equal justice gets uh, moving, there'll be a sixth one, but these, but we have a track record of, um, things getting accomplished in each one of these areas, I see, you know, I don't see any point in uh, saying we're not working on these things for the company. Okay, so then it feels like that's also a lot. <laughs> so I'm not sure we want to come up with more positions. Yeah, no, 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 no. Positions are, our positions are the, do we have, do, we, yeah, okay. You're, you're right, maybe that is a lot, but you never can tell. For example, when I was looking at, um, the national uh, national programs. It turns out they have a program that I I I didn't even know about, but was called um, this Democracy Truth Project. Um, so it. it was called the Democracy Truth Project, which Truth. which uh, basically dealt with disinformation and its impact on democracy. Uh, and they were trying trying to find out whether there we needed new laws uh, focusing on big tech like Facebook and Google um, to help. Uh, I guess the word is uh, lessen the impact of dis disinformation on our democracy. Since we're in sort of in the middle, we're located in the middle of the of the big tech area. Yes. If somebody's interested in you know maybe someone's interested in following up on that. Um, that's just a suggestion. I'm 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 going to be following it personally. See what the league does. There's lots of um, there are lots of other uh, organizations who are doing community education around that. But maybe maybe we want to do communication. That community. would be a good program for us to have for people yeah. to be. Um, so and and Lisa, is there any usefulness for us prioritizing? I I no I don't think so because. Okay. Okay. You know, because okay. we seem to have we seem to have momentum in each one of these committees, uh, and but in fact, you know, each one of the committees could use some more people to help them. Um, you know, in terms of positions, um, that's always a, we have we actually have lots of local positions. I tend to uh, be focused on the um, on the state and national positions because they've they have been very useful to what I'm interested in. But um, if someone's interested in something else in the in the existing uh, uh, issues that we're tackling, you can suggest that we might need a new position and we can have we can do a, a study on it and see. Oh, got it. Okay. And the last question is what should our league be known for? I asked a couple of the committee chairs what the league should be known our league should be known for and they basically said great community education and fixing things in the community. So in our local community, so gun safety said, uh, and they, they've been doing uh, community education in 2019. Uh, they did one in, in at Stan the Stanford law school. And then they said, well, what, what can we fix in our community? And they came up with fixing a local, uh, safe storage ordinance. Um, local campaign finance reform also came up with a fix, which was, you know, an ordinance, uh, changing how we spend money on elections. Um, affordable housing for all, they're going to hopefully come up with, uh, some pol get the city council to adopt some new, uh, housing and zoning policies. So community education and fixing things in the community, I think is what, when I did a, a, a um, informal poll of the committee, oh, I have, you know, and then civics ed, of course, got the seal of civil civics approval passed through the school board. So actually achieving achievable goals <laughs> that that uh, that exist in our community. Those are the two things. Uh, does anyone else have any want to throw out anything they think the league should be known for? Ellen Forbes has her hand up. OK, Ellen. Yes, um, last year uh, at program planning, I 
trying to lower that. Okay. Um, uh, Liz Ness um, talked about um, uh, transition, healthy transition back to viability for the city of Palo Alto. And um, it wasn't something that um, was easy to get your hands around. And I fully agree with Lisa that um, till you have somebody to tackle something, um, you know, somebody who will stand up and take the lead, you're not going to go anywhere with it. But um, are there any things like that that um, we might want to consider? It's a lovely issue, actually. Yeah. Well, I, if the issue is equitable transition out of COVID, I think all of our committees are sort of are dealing with that in some oh. fashion. Okay. Um, you know, um, it's it's you have to have something that's achievable, right? Uh, yeah, and small enough to for people to say this is exactly what we want done. So it's it's kind of a, a broad a broad topic. Um, if someone you know. Clearly, if someone wants to bring up, uh, has a specific proposal, uh, we'd be happy to hear about it, maybe at, at the next board meeting or whatever board meeting it happens to be at that you think that you have a proposal. We're kind of running out of time. We need to start on the national review of the national program. So I'm going to go there. Um, national program, the national program for the next two years, the National League rep recommends continuing with campaign to make democracy work, which is those four issues, voting rights, redistricting, improving elections, and money in politics. At the end of our meeting here, we're going to decide if we agree they should continue working on that. But before we agree on that, I, we thought it was important for people to understand what that actually uh, consists of. And so uh, Hillary Glenn and Liz Jensen are going to tell us what the National League's work in voting rights and redistricting has been. And I'm going to stop sharing and let Hillary start. Oops, I thought it was going to be Liz start. I know every time you tell me it's me and then I forget yeah. every time. Okay, here we go. Here we go. All right, I'm going to boogie through this. Lisa, how much time do I have? Uh, about 15 minutes. Me alone? No way. Okay. okay, we'll try to get through more than that. All right, so we wanted to talk about the uh, Making Democracy Work program, uh, specifically focus on voter rights. I want to get rid of this thing; it's in my face. Um, anyway, it. Uh, we want to talk about what happened after 2013 when the Shelby County versus uh, Eric Holder invalidated the Voting Rights Act of 1965. What that was most important about was called federal preclearance, which is basically preclearance as a fancy word for pre-approval. It meant that in states and counties who had a history of suppressing voters based on race or color, their law and redistricting changes were subject to review by the Justice Department. That went out the window in 2013. Um, right after that, the League of Women Voters launched its Making Democracy Work program focused on voting rights redistricting, improving elections in general, and money in politics. Um, then in 2021, they started focusing on the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act and the Freedom to Vote Act. They uh, started a program called People Powered Fair Maps around redistricting programs. And they went, man, you should be so proud of them. They launched lawsuits in so many states against uh, state voter um, uh, <laughs> laws that were, were uh, discriminatory and they've just not stopped since then. And Liz is gonna talk a little bit more about that. But even in today's New York Times, it talks about all the stuff that Texas, that they're doing in Texas, they're unstoppable. And I'm so proud to be a League of Women Voters member when I see what they're doing. Okay, and now why aren't you advancing? Simple things like advancing slides. Okay, so what happened as soon as we had the end of Shelby? Within 24 hours, Texas enacted a strict voter ID law. Um, other states that had not been able to do bad stuff because they were on the preclearance um, list just went crazy around voter IDs, making it harder to vote. And people purged like their voter records by crazy. Brennan Center thought that more than 2 million people were dropped off the ballots due to these um, voter purges. 
Mm -hmm. um, North Carolina, not to be outdone, did a new photo ID law, eliminated same day voting, shortened early voting periods, and banned early voting on Sunday. Um, many people feel that uh, banning early voting on Sunday or, or voting on Sunday is a way to, to hit up on the Black voters because mm -hmm. of the whole souls to the polls movement. Shut right. it down on Sunday, that ends that problem. Um, other state bills in other places made it harder to vote um, and did things that many people believe will deter racial minorities, the elderly, and the disabled from voting. So it was it was pretty comprehensive. Yes, so let's yes. let's talk about the uh, different Voting Rights Act that the League threw their support behind. The first was the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. It basically tried to update and strengthen the 1965 Act. It required um, it required uh, that any voting law changes be approved by the Justice Department if you are in a state with a history of minority voter support suppression, or you are in a state that enacted voting laws that negatively impacted minority voters. So it was a broader set of people. It wasn't just the usual suspects. You did something, you're on that, that uh, list. The bill failed to pass in the Senate because of the filibuster, and that happened on January 21st. Um, the companion bill, as it were, was the Freedom to Vote Act. This was a act that uh, Joe Manchin worked extensively on trying to get bipartisan support. Big old act, guys. It had a bunch of stuff in there, more opportunities to vote. Um, it it uh, tried to thwart voter suppression or election sabotage uh, attempts. It looked at, at redistricting, at voter reg, at compact uh, campaign finance reform, and enhanced voter security. Again, that same bill, failed to pass the Senate after a filibuster on January um, 21st. Um, but the League, hang on, I want to read this to you guys. Find that paper. The League basically said, after the bill went down, these bills went down, they said, we will not back down and we will not quit until every voter can safely participate in free and fair elections. So they were un, undaunted by this. Right. Um, the one remaining voter uh, voting reform act going on right now is the Electoral Count Act reform. Um, the Electoral Count Act of 1887 was very poorly written, really ambiguous language. This is the Absolutely. act that um, our buddy uh, John Eastman focused on to give an, a, a, the justification for Mike Pence overturning the election. Um, it is not a substitute for the stuff that was in either the Lewis Voting Rights Act or the Freedom to Vote Act. However, right. it's getting bipartisan uh, support. Um, there is a group of senators, I think there are 12 of them, uh, discussing reform. They're looking at clarifying the role of the VP, saying it is only um, ceremonial. They're narrowing the grounds and, and increasing the thresholds for challenging a state level vote. Currently, it just takes one member of the House and one senator to uh, challenge vote, and then you have to talk about it for four hours. So it's 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 pretty stupid. Um, they're putting in protection of elect. They're putting in discussing putting in laws to protect uh, election workers. Uh, they're looking at what can they do on voting practices and rights. Um, they are proposing changes to the Election Assistance Commission. I don't know what they are. The Election Assistance Commission is supposed to make it easier to vote. It was authorized in two, in uh, 20, 2002. Um, but not sure what they're doing there. And they're also talking about the presidential transitions. Again, no idea what some of these things are, but these are the areas that they're focusing on. Um, so what is the league doing now in the advent in the in the now that we've had the failure of those two voting rights bills? They're, you know, I think they're waiting and seeing on the Electoral Count Act reform to see what their position on it is. Um, they're concerned about the uh, uh, protection of election officials, um, which I I hope and pray will be part of the Electoral Count Act Reform Act. Um, they are just doing everything they can to stop voter suppression in states through a bunch of lawsuit, uh, uh, lawsuits. And they are also um, doubling down on the people powered fair maps um, activities in states where they're able to do that. I wanna hand this over to Liz. I think we wanna hold the, the questions till the end. Is that correct, Lisa? That's correct. That's correct. Okay, Liz, you're up. Okay, is Louise sharing my slides? 
Hello. I, I see a, a screen. Is that your screen or is that? Oh, it's Louise's screen. I think Louise is, is pulling them up. Yes. Yeah. You're getting there. OK, sorry. Sorry, I was muted. Yes, uh, I'm sharing your screen, uh, sharing your slides. OK. I'm just, sorry, that's now it's blocking my slides. Oh, you know why? Because I'm using the Google Drive. Is that it, maybe? No, I can. I just can't see. I'll just tell you uh, what slide I'm on. OK? OK. OK. Are you, is everyone with me here? I'm. We don't see the slide, though. Louise isn't. Can you not share? What we're seeing is an email from Liz. Oh, it has has a link in it that should give you the slides. So whoever is showing that email. Okay, okay, okay. let me go them. back. Sorry. Yeah, just share another screen. Now, can you see it? Nope. Nope. No, just no change. Box. Okay. Let me. Uh, let me try something different. Can you just click on the link that is showing? Are you seeing it now? No, no. You need to stop sharing and then reshare. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and then reshare because it's stuck back at the old share. Yeah, okay. that's what happens. Sorry about this. No, it's sorry. Right. It's You've I should be able to share myself. So the re I, I might as well just start talking, I guess. Um, so Lisa asked me to talk about redistricting today because uh, it's such an important part of the- Can League you see of it now? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, you can. Okay, sorry. Um, so Lisa asked me to talk about the redistricting today because it's such an important component uh, of the League of Women Voters campaign for making democracy work. Um, so we've all heard about redistricting, but what is it? It's the drawing of uh, district lines and boundaries for all levels of government uh, uh, where district elections are held. And it takes place every 10 years after the census to reflect population changes and to ensure that districts have nearly equal populations. It's required by the constitution and, uh, and federal law. And why do we care about redistricting? Because the way people are grouped into districts has just an enormous influence on who our representatives are and what policies they fight for. Um, it's the cornerstone of our democracy, this fair representation in government. Um, and what we strive for, the rule of one person, one vote. Uh, however, the way lines are drawn can leave people um, without a representative and they feel who feels responsible for their concerns and they can change laws and it, the people have no power in that if they're not fairly represented. So if you care about the economy and taxes and criminal justice and civil liberties, you must care about um, redistricting. Okay, so slide two. Who draws, these, who draws the maps? Each state has its own process for who draws the maps and how it's done today. I'm gonna focus on the congressional and state legislative maps, but there are also local governments who are responsible for redistricting uh, at the same time, but I'm focusing on um, uh, Congress and state legislative districts today. In 33 states, state legislators draw their own congressional and state legislative maps. And in some states, the governors have veto power and some don't. There's 17 states that have advisory commissions or independent commissions. These advisory commissions can be made up of legislators or non-legislators or a mix of the two, or, and they may draw the maps, uh, but the legislators in the end have the final say. And then some states, four states have independent commissions to draw their lines, and those include California, Arizona, Michigan, and Colorado. Um, so um, there are also political appointee and politician commissions and backup commissions, um, but I'm not going to talk about those really because it's mostly the state and uh, the other two types of commissions. Um, the big takeaway from here is that in most states we have partisan lawmakers drawing district lines. So politicians are drawing the lines to preserve the, their political power. Next slide. So why is it a league priority? 
Um, so redistricting um, along a partisan or racial lines distorts democracy and it weakens the voting power of minorities, creates not competitive districts and contributes to increasing polarization. So I wanna briefly highlight three cases that demonstrate how the league is defending democracy through litigation and are the basis for the league's work on redistricting. And one I'm not gonna talk about because Hillary already talked about that Shelby v. Holder case that removed that pre-clearance um, uh, provision. And so um, I'm not gonna talk about that, that but that's one reason uh, the league is working on redistricting. There was another case League of Women Voters of Pennsylvania brought. Um, in this case, the league success, successfully challenged Pennsylvania's congressional map. And the Pennsylvania Supreme Court said that partisan map, this, their partisan map violated the state constitutional guarantee of free and fair elections. Um, and that term free and fair elections was in the Pennsylvania Constitution. And so this case allowed the League of Women Voters to go and challenge maps in other states that have this free and fair provision in their um, in their constitution. So this case was a basis for the league to begin work toward constitutional fixes in 18 states. And then one other case was the League of Women Voters of North Carolina uh, in 2019. In that case, the Supreme Court refused to block a partisan gerrymandering case. And they said it was not a federal constitutional case. And as a result, the federal courts we're gonna take a hands-off approach, uh, even when partisan gerrymandering was done intentionally. And so these ca this case left it up to the state courts to fix gerrymandering. Um, so, and that's a problem because if the gerrymandering is done by the state legislator and they're drawing the maps, then there's no recourse except um, in the federal uh, courts now. So it's up to the states. Um, so next slide. How does the league take action? So if redistricting is a priority, what does the league do? What Hillary talked about, the, um, they started the People Powered Fair Maps campaign in 2019. Um, and they're using the two cases uh, to go after states. The goals of this campaign are to advocate for the creation of fair and transparent maps in all 50 states and DC. And um, that our people powered map drawing as opposed to incumbent powered map drawing. They want citizens to be involved in redrawing these maps. Um, so, and the other um, thing they do is educating the public about redistricting and increasing engagement in the 2021 map drawing process that is just finishing up. Um, the campaign focused on the states and changes that can be made at the state level. Um, so this, and this action also follows the, um, the league's commitment to DEI because gerrymandering affects all Americans, um, but its most significant costs are, are borne by communities of color. Okay, next slide. How the league fights um, for democracy or fights for redistricting, that People Powered Fair Maps campaign had five areas of focus. And I've kind of touched on these five areas, but the one, one area they're working on is, is in state ballot initiatives. So the league of, is advocating to bring these state initiatives to the ballot in several states um, to bring independent redistricting commissions to states that don't have it already. Like I said, there are only four states that have these independent commissions and the league would like to um, have more states uh, have these independent commissions. And one way to do that is through ballot initiatives. The second way that this the league is uh, helping states is that they're um, going after states that have that constitutional uh, clause in their, con that free and fair clause in their constitutions. And that allows them to, um, to go after cases uh, in those states and try to make, and try to change their redistricting or, and try to get, get these independent redistricting commissions in, commissions in place. Um, they're also working at the state, number three, the state legislature, -ish, state legislature level and league is advocating for bills to establish independent commissions at that level. Um, and like Hillary said, the league is working to, fe to pass federal legislation uh, that forbids line drawing for congressional districts solely based on party political advantage. Um, so the league is continuing to do this work. Um, you know, the Freedom to Vote Act didn't pass, but um, I'm sure the league will continue uh, their, league, their 
um, efforts at the federal level. And number five, there's always the league works to increase civic engagement and education in communities about the redistricting process. Okay, next slide. This is the league's position on redistricting. Redistricting should be vested in an independent special commission with membership reflecting the diversity of the district, including citizens at large, representatives of public interest groups and members of minority groups. And this came out of the 2016 uh, League of Women Voters Convention. And it also stated that we should use, be using standards that promote fair and effective representation at all levels of government with the maximum opportunity for public um, participation. So that's the league position. And what's happened, this is what's happened in California based on that league's national position on redistricting. So this is the national, this is California taking the national league's position and putting it into action. Um, so because that of that position, um, the California Citizens Redistricting Commission was created after the passage in 2008, it was Proposition 11, and it created the Voters First Act. And that, uh, so that determined that an independent redistricting commission was gonna be responsible for determining the boundaries of districts for state Senate, state assembly and board of equalization. Then in two years later, they in 2010, they added uh, another proposition, Proposition 20 passed called the Voters First Act for Congress. And that allowed the Citizens Redistricting Commission to add the responsibility of redrawing the state's congressional district boundaries. So the CRC that has been tasked with uh, determining um, draws these borders uh, after the census and they just finished their work. Um, this can, the commission consists of 14 citizens, uh, citizen members, five Democrats, five Republicans and four from neither party. And they, did their, they drew their first maps after the 2010 census and they just finished their work uh, following the 2020 census. So they've been, they've been hard at work. I'm proud to be in California and that we have um, such a commission doing this. When the commissions were, when these propositions were going to be passed, the, they did not have bite, they didn't have support from either party, either political party because um, Nobody wanted, no one was a fan of both because they were opposed, they were felt their districts would be threatened if they weren't able to draw the lines. Um, so neither, neither political party was really a fan of this independent redistricting commission. But it seems to be doing a good job. The Lee believes that as a result of the, the commission that California now has some of the most um, competitive districts in the nation. Um, and that's, these are the standards for redistricting that are consistent with the league's position. I don't need to go through them all, um, but mostly population equality and following the Federal Voting Rights Act um, are the standards for redistricting that the league has put forth. And then there are several other, you know, geographic continuity, um, integrity, compactness, all those uh, things. I don't need to go down that list, I guess. Um, um, so, uh, in Palo Alto, the redistricting that affected us included uh, Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors, Valley Water, Mid Palinsa, Open Space Trust, and Foothill De Anza. Um, so those are the local ones that Palo Alto uh, is uh, redistricting. And um, yeah, now the league is, and nationally, the league is litigating in three states, uh, Georgia, Ohio, and uh, Michigan. Um, so. That's, uh, those are big those are big cases still going on that haven't been settled yet in redistricting so um, I have I just have no I've gone over time but I want to leave you with one quote and that was I was watching a, a YouTube video of Nate Persley the Stanford Law School professor and redistricting guru and he said that since over 85 percent of our elections aren't competitive in the general election how we choose to divide our constituencies can be more important than who wins at the ballot box and so redistricting is just critical. And um, I think the, the league should better keep working at this and plugging away. So well, that's all I have. Thank you, Liz. Thanks so much. Thank you, Hillary and Liz, for taking on that interesting presentation. 
Let me see if I can share my screen. Can I make one snarky comment before we move on? Yes. Um, my snarky comment is if California did not have a redistricting commission, we would have figured out how to make sure that uh, Kevin McCarthy didn't have a congressional seat anymore. They would have gerrymandered his seat and made sure he was gone. So his position is directly attributable to the fact that in this state, we have fair maps. I'm done, I'll, I'll unsnark now. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, yeah. So uh, are, are there any other questions on that great presentation by Hillary and Liz? I, again, I can't see, so is anybody raise yeah. their hand? No. Nope. I had one thing, Lisa. Yes, yes. Um, it didn't come up with this, but the redistricting also comes into cities, as you know, and several cities around us have now been, redistricting isn't quite the word, but districted is the word, yes. and including Menlo Park. Mm -hmm. um, I think we should discuss it at some point. I think it's mm -hmm. a, frankly a bad idea because for the most part, you represent a city better if you represent the whole city than if you represent, you know, five to 10,000 of, of the people who live there. Mm -hmm. So at some point, I don't want us to lose that because uh, it's, it's a very, I think, unconscionable way the group of lawyers who does this has gone about doing it. And I'm, I'm not sure that it's familiar to everyone, but it's, um, I think, I, th I think it's it's a bad way to go about districting in very small cities. Mm -hmm. Once once you hit a hundred thousand, yes, I think that's probably more appropriate. But for lots yeah. of our small cities on the peninsula, it um, it, it it raises dramatic questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, that that's a great comment. Uh, one of the if I can briefly. Uh, go back to our local programming. Um, while we've been working on uh, campaign finance reform, I've been approached by several league members who are interested in different aspects of the electoral process, including rank choice voting, uh, districting is one, but uh, it, it, may be, it may be a good thing we should consider establishing uh, a electoral processes or improving elections uh, interest group. And under that interest group, we could have our, our campaign finance reform committee and any other uh, committees that want to work on, or any other groups of people who want to work on these other, these other uh, questions of how our elections should be run. Um, so uh, we're, we're here at this point. Should we continue with making, dem can you see my, sh yes, you can see it, right? Should yes, we, continue we can see with your screen. Okay, could, should we continue with the Making Democracy Work program in the league years 2022 to 2024, since we've just had a wonderful review of what that program is on the ground? Um, I'm going to raise my hand and say yes, even though you can't see me. Does anybody Absolutely. think no? Okay. Any discussion on this? Just as a uh, as a point of historical interest, the league has actually had some other major policy programs in the past. In 1921, when they were first established, they worked on their their major program was child welfare legislation. In 1935, they worked on national public housing legislation. Mm -hmm. After World War II, they worked on a public campaign to establish the United Nations. In 1972, they worked, their major campaign was to pass the Equal Rights Amendment. In 1983, they worked very hard on the National Voter Registration Act, also known as the Motor Voter Law. In 2002, after following the disputed election in 2000, they worked on passing the Help America Vote Act, uh, which, in, uh, which established provisional balloting and updated the voting systems because of, remember the hanging chads. And then in uh, 2019, they started People Powered Fair Maps, which is coordinating state efforts to eliminate partisan and racial gerrymandering. But they've been working on election reform uh, even before the People Powered Fair Maps Act, and they were instrumental in having um, California adopted citizen redistricting commission. 
So Lisa, it would be easiest if we had people raise their hands if okay. they are opposed versus if they're yeah. in favor. Okay, anybody opposed, raise your hand. Take it, nobody is opposed. Unanimous, it passed. Good, okay. Are there any other uh, issues do you think the uh, National League should focus on? And, and now I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you that uh, two leagues after outside of California, one from New York, and I forget where the other one's from, wants us to uh, let the National League know whether we agree that the on the agenda in the um, in the June National Convention, there can be consideration of a concurrence on national health care reform positions, and also an increased emphasis on immigration reform. If anybody's interested in what and the particularities of these proposals, just get in touch with me because they were sent in to me by some uh, uh, leagues that are leagues out outside our our league uh, who are interested in it. But um, I think uh, I think it's a good idea to put them on the on the national uh, convention agenda where they can be discussed. They're both very important issues, national health care reform and yes. emphasis on immigration reform. And the league already has positions on, all, on, on both of these areas. OK, who wants to? Ellen Smith has a, her hand up. I, OK, Ellen. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask, as, as you say, we have extensive positions in both these areas. Um, I, I understand the second one is just really talking about giving it a higher emphasis, presumably based on our current program. Can you very quickly say what the concurrence involves that would add to or somehow change the positions we already have? What's new about it? Yeah, that's a good question. I actually am not clear on that. And if, if people want to wait and talk about this at a board meeting, we can do that. Um, because we can also send, we can also make decisions about national emphases at board meetings and then just send our, 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 our um, answers in it uh, by March 1st. But, uh, I'm, I'm just guessing that I think, I mean, I did read it, but right now I can't remember what it was, but I think they want to go back to a focus on single payer, which was the, um, which was the uh, league position in the 1980s. And they somehow, the league has not been pushing for single payer um, as, a, as a legislative um, fix. And there may, be that, there may be that there is no actual position, which is, uh, which says, we, you know, the league thinks the best uh, policy solution would be single payer. I'm again, I'm guessing on this. I think but, it's there. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that that's what it's about. And again, uh, just this is just a vote. Should we should this be put on the agenda so people at the convention can talk about it? And my vote would be yes. Let them talk about it. So. So should we then once again vote in the negative? If you don't want it, raise your hand. Yes. yes, if you don't want it, raise your hand. Okay, there's one. So I believe we have one hand raised at the moment. Yeah, I just, I think there should be one thing that the league nationally focuses on at the moment, and that is the, the voter rights, voter suppression, what Hillary presented. I feel like now is not the time to push a wide broom for the mm -hmm. league at the U.S. level. And if we have a very uh, strategic focus, the state and the uh, county and the city leagues can follow suit. So I feel like surgical precision is needed at this time. That's that's just my view. OK. Great. I agree. Mm -hmm. It's too important right now to, to do anything but focus on this fundamental right. Yeah, I agree. I agree too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So maybe we need a revote, Madam Prez. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you want us to vote affirmatively or in disagreement this time? Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm I'm open to either way. I think again, let's let's do the negative. The negative, oh, it doesn't really, okay, the negative vote, if you do not think the National Convention should discuss uh, a concurrence on national health reform or discuss Im increased emphasis on immigration reform, raise your hand. So 
So far, we have four raised hands. Okay. And just to confirm, because Five. of the other reason, right? We're saying that because we need you to maniacally focus, not that these issues aren't important, but at least right. that's correct. And yeah. So five raised hands out of 22. Okay. Uh, Lisa, is there a way that we send comments? Yes, yes, comments, so exactly. I, I think that's where that should go in, that because I have a hard time voting for that just because of, of where we stand with workforce and immigration issues. Yeah, so, right. but I think maybe commenting that we, you know, there's, there's a eagerness for a laser focus or something like that. Right. Well, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yes. Okay. Thank, thank you, Megan. That's, that's exactly, that's I will, I'll put that in the comments. It's a, you know, an internet forum that um, I'll get to fill out. Um, if any, any of you want to have some input in that, just, just let me know. Um, I need to send it in by March 1st to the league, to the National League. Okay. Um, that actually is all we're supposed to do today. Um, and thank you all for attending. Uh, thank you all the committee chairs for the hard work they did. And thank uh, Hillary and Liz for taking on this added top, the added uh, national topics of redistricting and voting rights. Um, our, and so I, I don't think we, we're required to do anything else, but if we want to stay here and talk until 12, we can. Um, we've got about seven minutes left. Anything else you want to talk, anybody wants to talk about in terms of program? Oh, thank I'll you, stop Lisa. the recording. Okay. Thank you to Lisa and to Louise for being our 